Today, The Cure Chronicles is delighted to welcome Keisha Johnson. Keisha is an HIV activist, best-selling author, social media influencer, former music executive, and the mother of a three-year-old. After being diagnosed with AIDS at age 22, Keisha began advocating to change people's mindsets on HIV and AIDS by telling her story around the world. She also participates on a variety of women's empowerment panels. In January 2016, Keisha published a book called Dying to be Diva, which shares her experience to inspire others who are living with HIV. As a black woman who has lived with HIV for more than 16 years, Keisha is dedicated to using her experience and knowledge to help challenge the stigma around HIV and improve HIV awareness. Keisha, thank you so much for joining us on The Cure Chronicles today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, well, I got to say that I was really looking forward to this because I believe you have a, a very inspirational story uh, for people who are dealing with any kind of challenge. Of course, it relates to HIV. You were diagnosed with HIV and you've also dealt with cancer and then you've gone on to become you know, an empowerment maven. I want to know exactly what that is and a logistics mogul, yeah. um, self-proclaimed. So, um, yeah, and, and a mother, right? So, you know, you not just uh, surviving all these things, but bringing up a family. Um, can you Absolutely. tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your experience living with HIV and dealing with these other things and, you know, how it all comes together and, uh, you know, and how you manage all these things? Yes, yes. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, when it comes to talking about HIV AIDS, I just... I get on our rampage and I love it. Um, I, it lights up my life because I do know that a lot of people need to be educated about it. And, and I'm willing to sacrifice my story to do that. Um, when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed December 6, 2006. Um, so crazy because I was diagnosed with cancer August of 2020. Um, but once I was diagnosed with AIDS, actually, I did not know um, I was positive. I actually passed out in the shower and at a friend's house and I went to the doctor and they sent me home for a viral infection, respiratory infection. Um, that was not the case. I ended up getting sicker um, and having a fever of 105. Um, then I was rushed to the hospital by a family member, my aunt to be exact. And after being in the hospital for almost a month, they then tell me um, that I have AIDS and I only had two T cells, um, which is why um, I passed out was because my pneumonia, PCP pneumonia had took over my body. So in that moment, moment I was a bit kind of um, disheveled is because it was just kind of like, what? You know, you, you, you hear about things. Um, we hear about the, of course, the Magic Johnson story. We hear about those stories, but right. you don't, don't hear day to day stories about mm -hmm. it so for me it was just like wait what um and I just uh, I think I was a bit in shock for some months because I just kind of kept going and going and going my only message to my doctor was don't tell my mother <laughs> because she was my mother's um general practitioner and um, oh. she was different doctors um because their infectious disease doctor who was on staff just could not figure out what it was because it was lying dormant in my system um so after again weeks of testing weeks of trying to figure out what it was that was the diagnosis um from that moment i've always been a person that you know once it appears like i'm defeated i'm always going to do the exact opposite and mm -hmm. and try some way um, so I, I was diagnosed in December. I was doing my first speaking engagement, May of 2007. Wow. Um, um, I lost um, close to 100 pounds um, from wasting. That's what happens in the last stage. Um, yeah. Wow, um, you were really, uh, your, your HIV had really progressed and your AIDS was full on at that point when you're talking wasting disease. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they got you back on, they, they, once they figured it out, they got you on meds right away. And yes. uh, so you were starting to come back, but you were, but even in that situation, you were going out and starting to tell your story. That's remarkable. Yeah. Why, if, why, why was that the first reaction? 
Um, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why. Cause initially once I was diagnosed, I was under my mother's insurance. However, once you turn 23, that was an end. So, mm -hmm. um, an amazing United Healthcare insurance to absolutely nothing and have to get on state care. Um, so that I felt like, where do I go? Like right. I parents who's going to cover me. And um, I had Dr. Ong, which was here in Texas, in Katy, Texas. In my last visit with him, he had me do a clinical trial. Um, that clinical trial had me on Kaletra Travada. Um, I was taking 14 pills in the morning, 14 pills in the evening. And he said, I'm going to give you a referral. Try these clinics out. Um, one of those actual referrals led me to Hacks Clinic, which is now something else. But um, it, it was a clinic that was kind of ducked off here in Houston, mm -hmm. Dr. Garza and Dr. Hamill, which is an OBGYN for infectious disease. I, I was a bit like put off because it was um, in the community that services, you know, LGBTQIA community or trans um, women. So I was mm -hmm. just like, I'm okay with that, but nobody looks like me here, you know? So mm -hmm. it was, it was like, I was in a twilight zone in a sense, but I knew I had to do what I had to do to keep my health sustained because with that clinical trial, it did get me back to having an undertaking. And I looked incredible. You wouldn't even know that I was in the slump that I was just four months prior. But how yeah. was I, how was I going to, how was I going to sustain myself and keep myself there? And right. that was paranoia for me. So I ended up seeing a um, flyer on the door at that clinic for a, for a sister circle, a woman's circle. And I ended up calling that number because I was like, I don't know who to tell. Nobody knows. I'm in this box by myself and I have nowhere to turn. So in that, um, from that flyer, I met Kirby Gray, who worked for the Montrose Clinic here in Houston. And I went to him and I think that was the first time I just, I didn't cry, but I was just so I just went on a rampage talking to him. I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, where do I go? Where do I go get medication? <laughs> and mm -hmm. he's calm down. <laughs> How would you feel about telling your story? And I said, Maybe that will help. And it was on and running from there. So he encouraged you to just kind of let it out. And But it wasn't even just that you were telling your story to him. It sounds like you were like up and speaking to, you know, audiences of of high school students and you know other folks and you know what what was your what was the purpose of that like besides just you know being able to be out and uh you know sort of dealing with it consciously and you know not sort of hiding away from the stigma i mean what was the purpose of going on i mean that was a very brave thing to do to stand up 22 years ago and to say that you're HIV positive with the level of misunderstanding back then, I mean, it's still bad, but back then, you know, that was in the days of the 14 pills, right? Now you take one pill or a couple of pills a day and, you know, it's, it, it and the reliability of it's incredible. Um, but back then, wow. I mean, like you said, you don't give up. You, you face a, an issue and you just lunge into it you know, uh, just straight on, that really is above and beyond that. So why, why? You know, you know why? I've always been that way though. Like I've always been the fighter. Um, I started my career, which was kind of like a push in the career in the music industry. And I just saw a lot how women kind of were at a disadvantage right, in that. And so after being diagnosed, I was like, I will not be that unvoiced woman. Mm -hmm. I tell her story or talk or say anything or be muted. I refuse to do that. And after I spoke at Kashmir High School, again, here in Houston, the whole room was silent. And that was a room full of doctors, nurses, radio personality, musicians, and high school students. And the main question I received after I was done speaking was you don't look like you have it or you don't look like you have AIDS and all I could 
was like, it doesn't have a look, a smell, a touch. Like, and, and from that moment, I knew, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I have to do because it, 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 everyone literally looked like they saw a ghost when I spoke. And, yeah, and I was, because of the shock value of you getting up and saying that. But then by yeah. the time, you know, uh, you said you were, had lost all that weight and you were in wasting disease. I mean, you, must, you still weren't showing any outward signs, even when you were at that level of having, uh, you know, that progression of AIDS. But that's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. So you just looked a little skinny, basically. But other than that, you look normal. And so you get up in front of them and tell them, well, I have this, you know, virus. And people are having a hard time registering, like almost like they don't believe you. It sounds right. like, right? <laughs> yeah, huh? Do you think they were a little bit in denial of of HIV in general? The, was, were they sort of projecting on you because they didn't they didn't want to believe it, or or was it just that it was really that you know that the, that there was no outward sign and it was just that you know uh, stark uh, situation that people were like they don't believe it. Right. I think it's, and, and let's just be honest, in my community, in the community of men and women of color, it's one of those things we just don't want to talk about until it's affected within our inner circle, right? And it's the mm -hmm. world, period. However, in, in my community, it's one of those like, wait a minute, she has it. Oh, let's not touch her. Let's not talk to her. She can sneeze on me. She can breathe on me. And so it's almost as if and this is this the honest truth. They feel like Magic Johnson is the only person who has it. Yeah. And, and that's every time I hear it, they always refer back to him. And I was just like, you know, there are people who are living who are not NBA players, who are not, you know, world renowned individuals who are living this day to day and have to navigate stigma. But if mm -hmm. I forward, um, looking like this and, and talking the way I do in confidence and still living, working in an industry at the time that was, of course, would never talk about it. How many lives could I change if I do that? And that's all I thought about in that moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure it changed a lot of lives back then, you know, because there, nobody was talking about it back then. I mean, it was so rare that somebody would get up and be open about their status and you jumped right into it, just like you said, you know, you are going to face it head on. Um, and then you're talking to a bunch of people. And I guess part of the message is just awareness. But was there any other things where you're trying to get them to understand that, you know, this is something that affects everybody. And so you have to consider it. I mean, obviously, Magic Johnson is not relatable. You immediately write him off for a couple of reasons, right? One is an NBA, NBA star is a little bit hard to relate to uh, right off. But then you go, well, he slept with, you know, thousands of women, no wonder, right? Or something like that. You just feel like, mm, yeah, that's, it'll never happen to me. Yeah. And, um, but uh, the, the odd thing is, is that I guess there's been, a you know, some lack of awareness of it, or at least some lack of, of um, action uh, amongst um, the people of color. Because Absolutely. if you look at the black population in the United States is what about 14% and 42% of the HIV infections, that's ridiculous. So boy, you were really cutting right at the core of it, right? To go out to these high school students and to say, hey, look, you know, don't think you're immune, right? Absolutely. You know, don't listen to the preachers. This is not a, a uh, you know, a, a God's punishment for gay, right? You know, this is not a... Right. Right. You know, it's not a gay disease. It's an anybody disease. Viruses don't discriminate. Right? Yeah. And, um, and I, I suppose, right, you know, that 42% could have been 50% if people like you weren't out there and actually right. talking about it. So, right. so, so what was the reaction? Like you're, you, have, you have your family, friends, the community. Now you're like, you know, completely open about your situation and how they react to you. You know, I didn't tell my family. So I was diagnosed in 2006. I did not tell my family until 2009. And this was my reasoning. I, I feel, and when I talk to other advocates and just anyone in general, it's always best to tell third parties and family and friends when you have educated yourself and you are the most confident in it. Because oh. what is 
you never know how they're going to react. They're going to have a cry, a meltdown, a, oh my God, you're going to die. And you have to have some sort of sustainability to say, you know, no, that that's not where we're at now in this space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can live. There are people living and thriving. You can talk to them about what T cells are. You can talk yeah. to them about what and the undetectable. And when you're first diagnosed, those are questions that you don't even really know the answer to you to because it's coming to you so quick. Um, so mm-hmm. once, once I, I want to stop there for a second. That's terrific advice, right? Thanks. You know, the number one person to educate is yourself. Right. Yes. If, you, if you get this diagnosis now, some people who get the diagnosis may al- already have a lot of awareness. They may have friends or whatever, but uh, and there's more materials out there. So maybe it's a little bit easier than it was 22 years ago for you to get confident about the science of it. Right. You know, like the rational view of this and also to get your feelings sort of sorted out. Right. And then you face people who all, you know, you're you're you are kind of I hadn't thought about that but you're hitting them kind of cold right you go to your mother and you go um I need to tell you that I have HIV and you know that's a person who had never thought about that possibility knows nothing about HIV and the 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 broad spectrum of reactions right uh that you could encounter at that point like you said could be anything and but you were prepared at that point so did you how did it go with your your uh, friends and your family when you finally uh, you know had that conversation well every everyone cried the only person who didn't cry was my mother my mother is you know very conservative and very pristine so you know her thing um she just kind of shoot from the gun and she was she knew where I got it from she was like I knew that situation shouldn't have been no, you shouldn't have been with that person. Those were her words. Yeah, um, right. I get it. Yeah. Everybody did cry um, in a sense of like, oh my goodness. Just like anyone else, you think it's a mm-hmm. think life is over. Um, but when they saw my reaction and they saw that, okay, you were diagnosed in 06, but you look like this and you've been doing it this long. Okay. So educate me. Uh, a lot of people that I've talked to, uh, you know, um, felt that they should go and tell people right away, but you're right. You know, you were really thoughtful about that, that interaction. Um, and I, I'm listening to you. I'm thinking, yeah, you also had three years of history at that point, not just educating yourself, but you could, you could talk about a trajectory of it. Like, no, I'm not, you know, this is exactly how I'm dealing with it and it's working and I'm now, my T cells are recovering and, you know, that I have an expectation of a normal life and, you know, all those things that, um, you know, are, are, they sound more credible when you can speak from having dealt with it for some period of time. Whereas if you're just diagnosed, right, you, you don't have that uh, history to fall back on. Yeah. So, well, um, the, um, you know, one of the things that you did is you, you wrote this book, Dying to Be Diva. Yes. <laughs> and I hear it is a best-selling novel. I mean, congratulations. That's Thank you. amazing. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's kind of obvious what inspired you to write the book, but, you know, what was the message of the book? Right. You know, what, what, what were you, you know, what were you conveying in this story? Well, it, let me say this. It took me seven years to write the book. Right. I started in 07 and it was completed by 2013, 2014. And the whole point of it was everyone called me diva like that because I carried myself in such a way to where I was very proper, very, you know, kind of to myself. Um, I carried myself a certain way, so everyone took that as as a diva esque persona, oh. and so to the point to where you feel like you're trying to live up to something that other people have pegged on you. Mm-hmm. And by the time I looked, I realized that I'm literally dying on the inside from from trying to live up to a person in this label and this word that everyone is putting on me and I'm just Keisha you know that I mm-hmm. yes I certain way 
yes, I do. Um, I did come from a certain home. My mom is an educator, a dean. Um, I understand, yes, but that does not mean I have to live up to how you feel like I should live. And internally, I was really dying. I was suffering from mental health, anxiety, depression. I was in a um, horrible relationship that I accepted things that I should not have accepted because my exterior looked good, but my Ooh. interior was literally dying. Um, up until the point to where um, the book closes out, where the lady walks in and tells me that I have um, the AIDS virus. And I almost died from that, you know, to be very quite honest from you. Um, mm. I, I literally did. I was on a breathing machine. Um, so it's a book about to, the name makes you think like, okay, now what? Dying to be yeah. dead. I, I was genuinely dying to be to keep up with this person, but, persona and the big person that not saying that I'm not, but I'm not what you are building me to be. Right. Wow. So it, it sounds like because of, you know, the ovarian lottery, like where you started off from, there was some level of expectations on you and then you adopted those. Yes. Right. Yes. So you said, okay, well, I'll take that. Right. And you tried to live up to it. And then you actually saw that some of the consequences of not being true to yourself and not saying mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm going to be what I am, regardless of what you want me to be or what you think I am, I'm just going to be me. So one of the consequences of that was actually uh, getting the HIV, uh, you know, diagnosis or infection, yeah. uh, because you were accepting people in your life that, you know, otherwise you might have you know, passed on or avoided, right? Like that was somehow uh, related to the point up to the the uh, the whole journey to that day that you got diagnosed. Yeah. Well, that's remarkable. I think, you know, the so the title is intriguing, right? Dying to be diva, but it yeah. really is dying from being a diva. Exactly. In a way, right, exactly. yeah. And then the story is, you know, not about, your journey from the point where you got diagnosed, it's your journey up to that. And no wonder it's a best-selling novel because, uh, you know, the, that is something that is connectable again by almost anybody, right? Aren't, aren't we all in some ways trying to live up to other people's expectations? Sometimes we're just trying to live up to the expectations of advertisers on TV, or reality yeah. shows or, you know, whatever. And that lesson of, of, you know, to be comfortable in your own skin for better or for worse, you, you know, it, you don't have to be perfect and you don't have to have a perfect facade and you don't have to spend all that energy trying to create that perfect facade. Right. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Great, great idea for a book. I'm glad that it's, you know, getting such a great response out there. So um, you, you talk a lot in the book about your battles with mental health and, um, you know, that I think is also quite relatable. You know, people are afraid to deal with, uh, you know, problems in their thinking because it's invisible and there's a stigma associated with that as well. That always blows my mind. It's like you break your leg, you go to the doctor right? Because you're feeling a ton of pain in your leg and they can okay. fix you up and you can be more mobile. If you're feeling pain in your brain, like depression or, you know, anxiety or whatever, there is actually, you know, a whole um, field of medicine out there that can repair those things. And it isn't that you're, you know, when you take uh, you know, anxiety medication or something like that. I think a lot of people sometimes feel like that's, you know, being really vulnerable to go ahead and even treat a depression because right. it's sort of like uh, it, it maybe something similar to how people take feel about taking an HIV, you know, uh, treatment pill like antiretrovirals every day. It's like a reminder, right? Like I'm different, right? right. But the reality is, is that you know, if you're taking uh, any of these drugs, including the HIV medication, all you are doing is putting your, your life back into the zone of kind of normal or average, right? right. You're not taking mind altering drugs 
No, you're taking something that gently balances chemical activity in your brain so that you can kind of deal with things the same way that everybody else deals with them, feel the same amount of emotion over stuff instead of, you know, oversensitivities or, you know, circular thinking or, you know, kind of depressive cycles. Right. Uh, you know, that's what it's all about. So that's in the book. Um, I should I should shut up and let you talk about it here. <laughs> I'm, I'm not spouting my own opinion. But so what was your journey through that? You know, so you, you had a two, it sounded like you had a couple of reasons, you know, to feel depressed. One was, you know, you had to let go of the Steva thing, right? You know, because that, you know, not meeting your own expectations for yourself is depressing, <laughs> right? And overthinking that, yeah. And then you had this diagnosis. I don't know whether, you know, the book covers the whole uh, time frame, but what did you do to take hold of that part of your life and to make that kind of progress? Well, I've been dealing with mental health issues since I was younger. We, I just didn't have a name for it. Um, mm -hmm. I had panic attacks and anxiety for years. Um, I'm the only child. So it, it, I felt like it was always this level of excellence that I had to try to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. So I would constantly be in my own head, constantly uh, over, overachieving, but still mm -hmm. because of my anxiety. Yeah, I can relate to that. Yes. I had really successful parents and I thought I had to be perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's how yeah. you feel like you have to be, you know, and um, your parents. At least I had a brother and sister, right? Yes. You know, that I could compare myself to. Right. Right. Uh, but that's amazing. Like if you are an only child with that feeling, the only other people you have to compare yourself to are adults who had a whole Is lifetime to achieve. Yeah. Right. And, you know, unless they just happen to be sensitive to it and be like, hey, relax, Keisha, that's, you know, you're getting way ahead of yourself here and we're proud of you just the way you are. And, you know, what parents have time for that, especially, you know, when I think the last generation, I, my parents, you know, they had to go from survival to yes. that level of achievement, right? Yes. If anything, they thought I needed to be that driven because, you know, how was I going to survive if I didn't? you know, have, it, have all the skills that they had. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. You're blowing my mind here because I'm just like, I'm, I'm with you on all that stuff. Yeah. It's just, it's just not talked about. And, you know, it's so many now when I look back and even when I dress my mom now, she just looks and she's like, yeah, you're right. Maybe sh we should have talked about it more or maybe you should have brought it up. And I'm like, I literally have been <laughs> navigating and suffering for a while but yeah, I, yeah there's no you don't put a name to it because again universally but culturally uh -huh. we for sure don't talk about men's well because it's a sign oh, of no. yeah i just uh you know that's again i hadn't really thought about that but uh that's uh very interesting and and you know you're uh still young compared to me but the um but you know, when you, at that time, 22 years ago, right? And before that, the situation was even worse, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it's a, hopefully it's improving. Like, yeah. I, I feel like sometimes we can't even take that for granted. There are so many more dynamic um, advocates who are out telling their story and speaking. Um, I, it, it's crazy because when I have people still to this day um, look at me like I'm foreign and I'm like there are so many HIV AIDS advocates out there on TikTok or on Instagram mm -hmm. their story but it's also um it's not the top thing that people are going to say hey let me go to TikTok to find somebody talking about HIV <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. some run across so um even now there's a lot of work that still needs to be done yeah, well, I mean, it seems like almost on every front where there's a stigma, you know, we there's a ton of work to be done. And sometimes it's, you know, two steps forward, one step back, right? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's one step forward and two steps back. That can be really discouraging when, for some reason, you know, you're talking to an audience that just can't handle the stress right now. So right. They, 
they are unwilling to, you know, really even learn at that point and to open their minds and, and consider the realities of these things. So, okay. So then, you know, you're the impact net, let's get to the empowerment part. So you're, you're, you have these women empowerment panels that you participate in. Um, are Do you lead these things or do you participate in them? And is it sort of like a, a you know, a support group or, you know, what, what, what are the kind of topics you discuss and, and what are the outcomes of these these meetings? Awesome, awesome question. So it's a combination of all three, of, of all five, right? <laughs> to actually be a part of a panel or I actually have been doing tours over the years to where I'll go city to city and I'll have empowerment circles or empowerment um, gatherings to where it's about self-love because prior to the HIV, Prior to any of that diagnosis, I identified self-love and self-care with what it looked like. I look pretty, I look good, so I am good. And that's a vast majority of women and men, or men are told that they cannot be vulnerable and they just got to show up just because. So in these empowerment events, it's, it's for women, yes, but it's also for men anyone in between to understand that you have to empower yourself before you can engage in anything whether that's running a business whether that's um, saying that you want to find a life partner a husband a wife or in between or anything you have to master have some sort of self-mastery mastery not perfection but have some sort of self-mastery to say okay these are the things that i need to work on even though i need to work on them it's still okay mm. and on how to nurture those things because all those inner workings are components and pieces that are going to help you be able to run a business be a mom be a wife do all the other things that we externally want to do but we're not internally ready yet um so everyone asks me how did you get through having aids and being in the music industry and this and that and and to be very quite honest with you, I have empowered myself since I was little. All I had to do was play with myself and talk to myself, right? So, <laughs> you know, that kind of manifested itself into me understanding that no matter how far I fell, I'm still amazing, right? And it's going to take a little bit for me to get up, but I also need to figure out what are those things that's ticking within me that are like ticking time bombs that I need to like defect. And once I like admitted that, mm -hmm. I was like continue to empower myself, strengthen myself, not perfect myself, no one's perfect, but it helps right. me be able to achieve those dreams past having AIDS, past mental health. Yeah, yeah, that's, um... So it's, it's sort of like looking at yourself realistically, it sounds like. So you accept the, the strengths and the weaknesses. You tell yourself you're good enough, right? Like I can go ahead. I don't have to wait till I'm perfect to start whatever the next part of my journey is. I, I can't say that I've ever had, you know, a challenge in my life that's like getting diagnosed with HIV. But I do know that I've had a lot of very difficult things happen to me, Yeah. you know, and you can't relate to somebody else's, but... Also, I think the, you know, when people like you come forward like this and really talk about your experience, the HIV starts to demote in everybody's head. Like, yeah, that's not even the biggest deal, like, yeah. you know, in terms of life, right? You take a pill, you suppress the virus, you're not contagious. You, you have kids. Did you have kids that are HIV free? Yes, my daughter, she's a healthy four-year-old. <laughs> so There you go. Yeah. So, okay, you know, so it, and I, people just feel like life is over and it's just like people have no idea. It's like HIV is like the bottom of the list as to things that I have to navigate. Like cancer yeah. was way more of a doozy than yeah. HIV. Yeah, yeah, I that's right. And think about the number of people that are touched by cancer or have a immediate family member touched by cancer absolutely right and, and life is full of challenges and 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 life is, eventually is going to get you so enjoy it while you have it <laughs> it's not, none of us are going to go forever for sure 
Well, on that note, so what sort of advice do you have, just general advice for people or women specifically living with HIV or dealing with a cancer diagnosis or, you know, just facing challenges in life? Definitely. Uh, everything starts um, with self and moreover, don't be misconstrued by what you see. And to elaborate on that, perception is reality. I think oftentimes we see um, exterior, the outside world, social media, and it makes us feel like we can't be who we're called to be or who we're destined to be. Um, and, and that's even with the HIV diagnosis. We're either told that, you know, life is, is not meant to last long for us, or we can't be loved, or even with cancer, you know, once you're in a certain age, you're not going to make it through. And, you know, I am the complete epitome of what a person tells you in the beginning of life. You don't want these things. You want to eat healthy. You want to do this. You want to do that. And all of it has happened to me. And I'm still, mm. even with cancer, being diagnosed at stage 3B and going to 4 and being in hospice, I'm here cancer free. No evidence of disease, NED. So Way to go. You yeah. have Congratulations. To Thank you so much. You, yeah. you start with kind of empowering yourself and even in a sunken place, right? Because I think mm -hmm. people, you have to, you know, talk to yourself and motivate yourself. I'm telling you, in the darkest of places, just a simple sentence of, I got this. I'm, I'm a conqueror. I'm, I'm empowered. Just small little sentences in the darkest of moments can yeah. help to that next mo moment as a business person, as a person who's navigating HIV, anything. You have to speak to yourself in a nurturing, healthy way before anything else can blossom in your life. That is great advice. Like in medicine, one of the things that we see is there's a placebo effect if you believe you're going to get better. Yeah. And it's like 35%, right? You know, so you give people like a, a placebo drug for their cancer and you tell them, oh, this is a cure, right? And, and there's a aberration in the data amongst the people who just have that positive attitude, who believe that they can get through this crisis, who believe what the doctor is telling them. Sometimes that's why bedside manner is so important. And you're saying you can have that self-talk. Yes. You can have that positive attitude. You can say those few words for yourself as you face any challenge, whether it's yes. cancer or something else, right? And and you can improve your odds, right? You and can. you can make it through. Yeah, yes. and your yeah your story is an example of that. Wow, uh, you know we could do a show on every single point you brought up. Is yes. is there anything you know in, in kind of closing up? today it, um you know, i really appreciate you spending all this time with me of course. but is there anything is there anything that you're working on right now that um you'd like to tell people about because i you know your book uh, let me look right into the camera for this you're watching this thing go get that book it sounds fantastic <laughs> i'm running after running out right after this interview to get it myself but you know, that's a really important uh, story arc. No wonder that book has been popular. But anyway, you working on anything else that we should be aware of? Yes, 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 yes. So I've been on this cancer tour, um, which is called Cancer Could Never, which is my new book um, that's available on barnesandnoble.com. Or you could just Google and you'll find it. And it's really the whole, my whole cancer journey and how I spoke life in, to myself to get through it. Um, it's mm -hmm. seven years. Um, in, in each of the chapters, I have prayers. I actually have smoothies and, and different um, playlists and song lists that I had that got me through cancer. And everything that we kind of talked about, about self-talking, you get mm -hmm. through the walkthrough of exactly how I did that. And um, on this tour, I'm literally going city to city, um, talking in, to cancer survivors and honoring cancer survivors. Um, I started it last year, April, 2022. And Tabitha Brown actually hosted the first one and it was awesome. And she said, this is something that you need to do because people need to see that you can get out of what mm -hmm. you've been. And so, you know, we're five cities in and my goal is to just keep going city to city and inspiring people with letting them know um, 
I'm HIV positive and yes, I did um, get colorectal cancer, but I got through it as well. So that's really my main thing is now, you know, is to just give back. Like it's been put on my spirit to just give back through my story and go city to city empowering others. And, and that's what I'm mm-hmm. doing. Yeah, that's, a, um, you know, having purpose is something that's very satisfying too, right? I mean, it sounds like you have found something that's giving back, uh, you know, that is fulfilling as well yeah. and, and empowering to the people in the audience, but somehow there's a little bit of it that's empowering to you as well, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. I, I find that, um, you know, the the work that we do trying to cure disease, sometimes that's, you know, a big part of why it's so fun to go to work. It's because yeah. I'm pursuing something, not necessarily just 100% for myself, right? You know, I'm not just making a living. I'm trying to, you know, lift other people up and, you know, help to ease their their burdens. Um, and that is just, I think it's a wonderful quality that humans have, that empathy where we could actually take away some joy from the fact that we help someone else as opposed to, you know, just always trying to survive. So that's cool. And I hear that's going on every day at these, you know, when you go out and you talk about cancer or HIV. Well, um, yeah, terrific, terrific interview. Uh, Is there anything else I didn't touch on that you'd like to uh, cover, you know, before we, you know, give you one final thanks for, for showing up today? No, that is, that is pretty much it. Those are all of the questions. I mean, anybody just feel free um, who's ever not navigating HIV or a cancer diagnosis. Um, mm-hmm. I'm here for, I'm actually producing a hotline that will be able to call in to where you just need to get through the moment because I understand how traumatic cancer and or a HIV AIDS diagnosis can be. Um, I'm here. So feel free to look me up, click on the link. I'm always available and I'm always accessible to help someone through to their next moment. Well, so kind of you to, you know, to offer that vast experience, uh, you know, to help others. And if you don't mind, we'll, we'll put some information about about you in the, uh, the notes uh, for this video. And so, you know, uh, people can get in touch with you or see some of your things online and take advantage of this. Uh, yes. of that kindness. Thank you. Uh, and thanks again for being with us today. Thank you so much. It was an awesome conversation. Thank you.